the chapter in which God confused the languages of men, we get to enjoy the misogynistic lineage from Shem to Abram, and we see the first direct mention of incest in the Bible. Good, wholesome fun for the whole family. Stick around. Abraham will have to sacrifice a goat and say a prayer to purify you if you don't hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. So do the thing. Abram and the goats need a break. Now, on with the show. Just a quick primer about chapter 11 in Genesis. It's broken into three parts. Part one is the story of the city of Babel. Part two is more useless begats running from Shem to Abram. More wasted space as they already covered most of the lineage in the previous chapter. And finally, it closes by giving us our first introduction to Abram. So, to part one. Throughout my Evil God Monster of Abraham series, I've repeatedly mentioned that there seems to be no culture, music, or beauty of any kind so far in the Bible. No mention of great works of art, acts of kindness, glorious cities, or any measure of something we would know as civilization. In fact, we've already covered 10 chapters of the Bible, and so far we've encountered blood, murder, misogyny, lots of misogyny, animal sacrifices, genocide, and the entire population of the planet apparently still lives in tents. But nothing we would consider civilization. Now, for the first time in the Bible, we're going to see men come together to build something great and wonderful. The first sign of the greatness of man mentioned in the Bible. Now, I already talked about tents, but in verse 3, chapter 11, the humans of earth up their game and start making bricks. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the earth. So finally, men are beginning to embrace civilization and increase their standard of living. Yay! But wait, God doesn't see this as good. I thought the reason God didn't like it was because they blasphemed and were thinking they could touch the heavens and be like God. But nowhere in the text does it say that. I checked several versions and the only sin or possibly negative thing I could find was where they said they wanted to make a name for themselves. That's it. Nowhere, so far, does it say making a name for oneself is a bad thing. There's simply no good reason listed in the Bible as to why God would want to scatter people over the earth and confuse their languages. It reads as though God came down, saw that men were working together in peace and harmony, and became offended by their progress. Genesis chapter 11 verses 5 through 7. But the Lord came down to see the city and the town the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now at this point, you'd think he'd be proud. It sounds like he just gave them a huge compliment, mad props and whatnot. When you work together, you can accomplish anything. But let's continue reading because that's not what he meant. The God monster goes on. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Together they can do anything. And we can't have that shit. They are doing great, working together in apparent peace and harmony towards a common goal. A true God of peace and love and mercy, I suspect, would appreciate their efforts and applaud them. But a narcissistic, evil God monster filled with petty hate and rage might not be so pleased. And of course, you know how the story ends. God scatters people across the whole world and confuses their language. Literally, to keep them from succeeding. Again, just to kind of drive it in home, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come. Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. But we all know what's really going on here. The author of the Bible is merely trying to explain why there are so many different languages and not just a single language. Got it. Cool story, bro. Once again, you've painted your God in the shade of a real dick. It's not a lesson about the humility of man in the story of Babel. It's about the pettiness of God. Part 2. The Beguiling Begats of Misogyny. Okay, so in the second part of this chapter, it doesn't actually use the word begat, but you know what I'm talking about. Shem was the son of Noah, and Shem had a son named Bob, who had many sons and daughters. And Bob had a son named Steve, who had sons and daughters, and Steve's son Hank, etc, etc, etc. Begat, begat, begat. But at least, in this lineage, women get some mention when it says a man had sons and daughters. Otherwise, females are once again completely left out. Ten generations of a family line, and not a single wife, daughter, or mother. Other, his name. A mind-numbingly boring waste of text, space, and time. On to part three. We meet the father of the Abrahamic religion, and we see direct biological and marital incest in the Bible for the first time. 
Terah had three sons, Abram, who would later go on to become Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran had a son, Lot, then he dies. And then we come to verse 29 of chapter 11 of Genesis. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Nahor's wife is the daughter of Haran? So... So Abram's brother was married to his own niece, the daughter of his other dead brother? Yep. So there you have it. The second marital incest directly stated so far in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying it's the second implied incest in the Bible. If we were talking implied incest, we'd need to start with Eve and her sons. If the creation story is to be believed, either Eve had sex with her sons or Adam and Eve had other daughters with whom Cain and Abel had sex with to initially populate the earth. Either way, incest would need to be involved. Then later, Noah's sons and wives and their children would have to have been incestuous again in order to repopulate the earth after the flood. All implied incest. But verse 29 specifically tells us the dude married his own niece. Naughty, naughty, naughty. So is that bad? Is that incest? Uncle and niece? I mean, even in the South, that'd raise an eyebrow or two. But who, you ask, is the first marital incest directly stated in the Bible? What's well, Abram and Sarai? They're not kissing cousins or uncle and niece, nothing like that. No, they are brother and sister. Yep, the father of the Abrahamic religion was in an incestuous marriage with his own sister. Twice in the upcoming chapters, Abram, or Abraham, being a brave and noble man, a man of honor and strength, will pass off his wife as his sister and give her to other men to save his own hide. Genesis 12 and Genesis chapter 20. But what many don't know is that she really was his sister according to him. The second man he gave his wife to asked him why he would do such a thing. And his response is in Genesis 20 verses 12. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not my mother. And she became my wife. So Abram's brother married his own dead brother's daughter, and Abram married his own sister. This is the man who in later chapters speaks to God and goes on to be the father of the Abrahamic religions. The patriarch of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is literally introduced as an incestuous scumbag from a family of incestuous scumbags. Exactly the kind of craziness you'd expect from the evil god monster of Abraham and its book of death. Did you know Abram and Sarai were both husband and wife and brother and sister? Let me know in the comments below. Remember, spare Abram some goats and give me a thumbs up, a like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Thank you and take care.